Hello, this is Seth Ward. This is a PowerPoint Hello, with a narration. It is part two of a this series a on Christianity. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it informative and useful. Thank you. And useful. Thank you. We're going to start this section of the Christianity lectures with Paul and go on to the time of Constantine and the Roman Empire in Byzantium. Paul never met Jesus. He died around 65 in Nero's persecution of Christians. Paul was a Pharisee uh, portion of the Jewish people that comes in for an, a lot of criticism in the Gospels, and perhaps the criticism is one more thing that reflects Paul's conversion and his antagonism towards uh, the life that he had been leaving, uh, living. Uh, in any case, the Pharisaic movement is very similar in some ways to Jesus' movement in terms of its democratization of Judaism expansion in certain directions, uh, teachings such as saving life takes precedence over the Sabbath and so on are very familiar from Pharisaic, uh, from the Pharisees. In any case, Paul had a vision on the road to Damascus, and that converted him from a Pharisaic Jewish approach to a follower of Jesus. He wrote letters, most of the epistles, epistles is just the word that means letters, most of the epistles in the New Testament are from Paul. Paul's vision of Christianity transformed the young movement. In Corinthians, he, in his letter to the Corinthians, he wrote very compellingly that the main point of their belief is the belief in the resurrection of Jesus and that that resurrection makes a difference in their lives. It's a key to salvation. And that without this belief, their faith is futile. Paul also was responsible for contrasting life of the spirit with life in the flesh and one could probably credit Paul with a movement from the, uh, within the uh, followers of Jesus, within the early Christian church, that tend to open the way for understanding human physicality in a negative way. This is consistent with an awful lot of uh, Greek philosophy, which looked at the spiritual world as being true in a way that the material world was not. Greek philosophers talked, for example, about whether a particular table or chair was accidental and that it could be any old thing. The chair could be any color. The table could have three legs or it could have six legs or four legs. But the idea of table, now that was eternally true. And uh, what was necessary for a table in the idea world, in the world of ideas, had a kind of truth which went beyond the temporary material world. In any case, in Pauline theology, life in the spirit is far more important than life in the flesh. All the Gospels were written after Paul, uh, and they reflect central elements of the Pauline teachings, especially with the role that they give to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus and the way they tell those parts of the story. The early Christian movement talked about various ways in which authority was handled. They talked about scripture, they talked about tradition, they talked about authority of the bishops, basically. The apostolic succession is a word the apostles means the uh, friends of Jesus, the 12 apostles, but when we use it with a succession, that means that we're talking about the bishops and the priests who were trained by the apostles and uh, commissioned by them. For Catholics, there was a notion that Peter was appointed to lead the church after Jesus and that the Pope who sat in the uh, seat of Peter in Rome the Pope was the first among equals and has a special role. There is a notion that there is a teaching authority that comes along with the church. 
an important idea which occasionally leads to the Pope having infallible ideas which are expressed from the papal throne, ex cathedra pronouncements. This is invoked very, very rarely, uh, despite the ideas of having a papal statement of doctrinal faith, popes don't use it very often. It was used to define a very ancient idea that Mary had been born through immaculate conception. That means that Mary, not Jesus, was born in this particular way, such that her con the conception of Mary was, I'll say, normal through sexual intimacy. Nevertheless, she was born without original sin. Now, that idea was very ancient, but in 1854 it became church dogma. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church required believers to accept it. And in 1950, the assumption of Mary, the idea that Mary rose into heaven uh, after her, what normal, normally we would call after her death. Uh, in um, some Catholic and high, church, high Protestant church circles, we hear about the dormition, the sleeping of Mary, and then she rose into heaven. The Nicene Creed refers to one holy Catholic and apostolic church. These are sometimes called the four marks, and they're part of the definition of what the church is. It is a unity, it is holy, it is universal, and it accepts the authority of the apostles and their uh, tradition. I have a slide here. Uh, setting forth how tradition, scripture, and teaching authority work. And this is from the very important Vatican II Council in, uh, and was released in 1965. It talks about the sacred deposit of the Word of God. Notice that scripture is joined by tradition. We saw something like this in the Jewish tradition where you have the written Torah, but you also have an oral tradition. The written Torah is uh, the word of God. Every letter is holy. Every letter is determined according to, uh, to traditional ideas. The historicity of this, the development of scriptural text is something, is a different issue. But the fully formed idea was like that. Sacred tradition in Judaism, the idea of oral Torah, uh, did develop over the years. Its idea went back to Sinai, but there's also a continuous teaching tradition which developed it and found out more about how it worked. In any case, here you can read <coughs> excuse me, here you can read the definition of sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and sacred deposit. Uh, in Catholic teaching according to Vatican II. The living teaching office of the Church is entrusted with interpreting the Word of God. It exercises the authority in the name of Jesus and teaches it with the help of the Holy Spirit. And you therefore have the idea of tradition, scripture, and teaching authority linked and joined together so that they're all part of one holy church. To go back to the early period, we're going to skip ahead to the times of the middle of the second Christian century. Marcion died around <coughs> 160 CE, but his teaching was already held to be heretical by the church in 144. Marcion took Paul's contrast between the law and the gospel to astonishing lengths. In Marcion's teaching, the law represented the demiurge, the uh, something less than the full teachings of God. And the New Testament was the God of true love. Marcion accepted only ten Pauline letters and not the full version of Luke and Acts. The book of Acts is usually considered to be written by the same author as the book of Luke. Marcion, importantly, did not accept the Old Testament as being part of Christian tradition, since it was 
the work of or inspired by or loyal to some sort of, uh, well, it was less than the New Testament. The most important response can be put in the name of teacher Irenaeus, a student of Polycarp, wound up being the Archbishop of Lyon in southern France. Irenaeus talked about the importance of the quadruf quadrifold gospel, the fourfold gospel, uh, the four books that we have today as canonic, and the importance of the Old Testament. The Old Testament continued to be an issue. The simplest way to look at this is that uh, the next two or three centuries dealt with various versions of these ideas. Marcion had many of his ideas from a Gnostic approach or an approach in which there was a hidden God who was true and light and very difficult to understand without special knowledge and a more apparent God who was responsible for the mess that our world was in or something like that that underlays a kind of dualism in the Gnostic world, Christian Gnostics weren't quite, I mean, they, they affirmed monotheism as well in many, most cases. In any case, the um, role of the Old Testament was, that the Old Testament was part of Christianity was already clear by the second century in terms of what was ruled to be heretical. Uh, however, its role was still being debated uh, I'd like to point out that in the early 4th century, Eusebius, who was at, the Nicaea, at Nicaea where the Nicene Creed uh, was written, he wrote about the Old Testament as preparation for the Gospel and developed a very compelling theory about how the Old Testament should be read. Well, I mentioned the Gnostics. I'm not going to speak about them in that great detail. The Gnostic idea, the definition of Gnosticism, is tied in with the, uh, with the notion that you have special knowledge. Uh, Gnosticism, the root is from Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, and talks about knowledge. Uh, ignorant is a word that we have in English that comes from the, comes from the same root. Gnostics generally were against the material world. Generally, they thought that there was special teaching among, uh, by Jesus that allowed people to become more holy and to succeed. Uh, some of the early Gnostic Gospels give us the impression that Jesus' teaching was not so much that people could be saved, as most Christians today understands the word, understand the word, but people could become divine or holy, or have eternal spirits in the ways that Gnostics understood it, more like unity with God, or becoming God in some spiritual or mystical sense. There are many other movements. The Mandeans and the Manichaeans really were not Christians. They were, uh, especially the Manichaeans, were dualists. Mani died in 275, a very popular movement in both the Persian and the Roman uh, world. Mandeans still exist today. Modern Mandeans uh, might say follow John the Baptist and very interesting sect which still exists in, in Iraq to this day. The Docetist heresy believed that Jesus was so fully divine that things like the crucifixion merely appeared to happen in terms of the reality. Jesus couldn't really have died on the cross because the Jesus was really the embodiment of the eternal God. So it was a show. It was something that appeared to happen to us. There is an image of this in the Quran. Uh, Muslim teaching also includes a line in the Quran that Jesus did not really die on the cross. It only appeared to be the case. Nag Hammadi uh, was a location in southern Egypt in which a large supply of gospel-like texts, uh, often called the Nag Hammadi Gospels, or most of the, many of them are non-canonic. I mean, they're all non-canonic. They're not part of the biblical canon. The Nag Hammadi texts give us a window into many of the heretical movements of that time. Some of the non-canonic gospel texts are quite interesting. Some of them are a lot of fun. Many of them, 
both from Nag Hammadi and other non-canonic texts that survived, sh- shed light on some of the strange ideas or strange ideas for Christians that are found in the Quran. Uh, one of the interesting texts is called the Infancy Narrative of the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, and talks about Jesus and his friends making clay pigeons, and uh, Jesus' pigeons would uh, uh, fly away when the elders came and told them that they were doing so, and it was the Sabbath they shouldn't be. And there's a there's an echo of this story in the Quran. Uh, we learn an awful lot about Gnostic Christianity, about some of the viewpoints. On the whole, the early Gospels have... Jesus as being more divine than he's pictured in the canonic Gospels, and uh, talk fill in some of the parts, as I said, the infancy Gospels fill uh, some of the stories of Jesus' youth, or they tell us other details that would have been interesting to early Christians that simply are not part of the Gospels that made it into the canon. One of the themes of early Christianity was the development of asceticism. For example, Simon Stylitis, who died in 459, uh, lived out part of his life on a pillar 60 feet above the ground. Antony Pacomius are associated with monasteries. And the development of asceticism, an idea that one should reject this world, limit one's food, limit one's motion, uh, live in a monastery in the wilderness or on a pillar or some other place that's removed from regular earthly activities to emphasize spiritual life. This became very popular. The Wikipedia site that I've highlighted called Books of the Bible has a nice chart showing the different books as organized by the Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox traditions. The Hebrew Bible has only what Christians call the Old Testament, and the nature of the Protestant Reformation was such that within a century or two, most Protestant Bibles only had the texts that were in the Jewish Bibles and the Hebrew Bibles. Catholic Bibles generally retained a number of works that were in Jewish Greek, the Jewish Greek Bible of old, the Septuagint, the translation of the 70 but not found in Hebrew texts. Books of Susanna and Tobit and Maccabees and some sections to the book of Esther that were not in Jewish Bibles. The Eastern Orthodox traditions have a number of unusual books that are not in either the Jewish or the, either the Greek or the Hebrew Jewish traditions that are considered part of Old Testament. Some of it is intertestamental literature and so on, Uh, stuff that is later than the Hebrew Bible, but earlier than the Protestant Bible. The order is also different. Most Catholic and Protestant Bibles follow an order that follows the Hebrew, the Old Testament books follow the Greek Bible tradition rather than the order of the books as put in in the Hebrew Bible. One other uh, idea... One other important thing about the order of the books in the Christian Bible, although today most scholars believe that Mark is the earliest of the four canonic Gospels, the Christian Bible tradition always has Matthew as the first of the Gospels. The epistles are generally organized, the Pauline epistles come first and then all the others, and then Revelation at the end of the Christian Bible. Suppose there is an important thing to say about the message that's given when you order things in certain ways. In Hebrew Bibles, the end of the biblical canon is the book of Chronicles, which ends with Cyrus' uh, uh, declaration of the restoration of Jerusalem and not the book of Malachi, although Malachi is considered to be the latest prophet. In most Christian Bibles, uh, you have Malachi as the last book with its vision of the great day of the Lord and of the coming of Elijah to restore uh, 
everything, and you have then you have you turn the page and you have Matthew and you have the beginning of the story of the birth of Jesus and how that fit in with the Old Testament material. A different order might very well transmit a different idea about how one is to understand the Bible. So the order of the books as they've been edited is not uh, random and conveys meaning. The slide mentions the word lectionary and most Catholic and Anglican Episcopalian churches and some of the other high church Protestants have a very similar lectionary. This is an order of reading the books of the Bible in churches that's key to the religious year. Prayer developed over time. I should mention that the notion of having prayer as opposed to sacrifice is a notion that seems obvious to us today but was not obvious in this period from Paul and the early church fathers. Most of the, I'll call them religious traditions of the world at that time, had instituted sanctuaries where the ritual was associated with sacrifices, almost always animal sacrifices, as well as offerings of uh, flour and bread and wine and water and possibly beer and other and other foods. <coughs> the idea that the sacrifice could be dispensed with and replaced by liturgy, the Jewish idea after the temple was destroyed, or done in a symbolic way where bread and wine became the body and blood and were offered to the populace rather than actual bread and wine or meat and uh, flour. That idea was transformative and uh, not at all obvious in late antiquity. In any case, one could say also that here the Gospels reflect the religious reality. Regardless of whether Jesus actually handed out the bread and wine and said, these are my, uh, do this in remembrance of me, regardless of what one thinks about whether it becomes his body and blood, early church worship on the Lord's Day would have some sort of Lord's Supper in which they would recreate this experience and therefore the Gospels all highlight this as part of the explanation of how they came to be. Remember, the Gospels are, as Luke tells us explicitly and uh, implicitly in all the others, Luke tells us that this is what you need to know. There are lots of stories, but he's telling you what you need to know uh, for your faith in the, in the correct form. These are stories that are designed to bring you the good news and to tell you about the wonderful events that have happened and the uh, life and times of Jesus that you need to know to be a Christian. The purpose is not like, for example, a daily newspaper trying to give you the news in a very neutral, uh, detached, and dispassionate format. In any case, over time, uh, the prayer came to have a number of units. Uh, the Mass generally has the liturgy of the Word. There is reading from the Scripture according to a lectionary and a homily, a short sermon about the reading. And then there is the liturgy of the Eucharist, giving thanks. Eucharist is a Greek word. Modern Greeks say, evcharisto, uh, thank you. And uh, so the liturgy of thanksgiving, which involves consecrating the wine and the bread and distributing it to the people. The Lord's Prayer, a passage that's found in two of the Gospels, is recited as part of the liturgy of the Eucharist. So is the Sanctus, Sanctus, Holy, 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 a passage from Isaiah. And there are a number of places where you can find the entire text of the Catholic Mass. The Catholic Church developed an idea of sacraments 
These are actions that are required. They are parts of making things holy. And by the Middle Ages, there were seven that emerged as the seven sacraments. Baptism, Confirmation, Eucharist, Penance, Anointing the Sick, Ordination, and Marriage. Typically, Catholics will do baptism as early as they can in the life of a child. Confirmation, one could say, is, well, confirmation can take place at various ages. Eucharist, uh, that is a sacrament that happens in church, in some cases, uh, multiple times a day. Uh, penance is the what used to be called confession. Anointing the sick is something that happens close to death. Ordination is ordaining priests, and marriage, the uh, as a sacrament, is uh, well known. Point out that this is marriage is a sacrament, which means it's a religiously determined idea rather than a civil arrangement or uh, one that's one one that could be done with a justice of the peace or a ship captain or something like that. And uh, this may make it somewhat different from how marriage is seen in other traditions. Differences about the baptism, what it means and when to do it, underlie some of the differences between the various churches in the Western tradition, as do differences in the meaning of Eucharist. Most of the Protestant churches only have baptism and Eucharist as sacraments, and don't really have the rest of them in the same sense as sacraments of the church. I mentioned the Christian year earlier in terms of the lectionary. Here are some of the markers of the Christian year. <clears throat> Ordinary time, the time that's after the great events of the liturgical calendar, uh, ends, you might say, the fourth Sunday before Christmas with Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Candle Mass, or the Feast of the Presentation on February 2nd. That recalls a passage in Luke in which Jesus is brought into the temple. Lent, several weeks later, uh, begins on a Wednesday uh, with Ash Wednesday. Catholics will put ashes on their foreheads. It lasts 40 days, excluding Sundays uh, before Easter. The last week before Easter is sometimes called Holy Week. It begins with Palm Sunday. The Palm Ceremony actually probably reflects a tradition of another, uh, I'll say, revolutionary slash uh, religious movement slash political movement in which we do have a reference uh, independent of their own. Well, we have a reference from uh, Josephus, I believe. Uh, in which they entered the temple on uh, the festival of Sukkot, of tabernacles, when palms are generally used as part of the ritual. I don't think that that happened with Jesus. I know that I've seen people who say that the festival of Sukkot could be celebrated at other times, and they give the Hasmoneans who redid it because the temple was desecrated by the Greeks, and they give the New Testament reference, but there's no independent confirmation of the New Testament uh, idea of palms. In any case, Holy Week uh, includes the uh, washing of the feet on the Thursday and the uh, recollection of the uh, uh, crucifixion of Jesus on Friday, Saturday night, Many churches will have an all-night vigil uh, with the Feast of the Resurrection and uh, the statement, He has risen uh, in honor of Easter. Uh, at one t time, Christians asked Jews when Passover was in order to know when the festival of Easter was. One could argue that the Nicene Council that was convened in 325 in the Christian era, uh, had a number of decisions that were very important. Some of them had to do with the creed. Uh, some of them had to do with simply calculating Easter so that it would be independent of Judaism. And this marked 
a turning point in the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Uh, from the point of view of people totally outside the tradition, uh, Jews and Christians could be confused with one another in that many of their ideas were very similar. Uh, they had the Old Testament, they had a number of very similar monotheistic ideas, they rejected the idolatry, they rejected uh, the worship of the sun and a number of other things that uh, were common in the in late antique world. Uh, experts within the field were very much aware of the differences between the two traditions, and by the fourth century, the split was permanent and very much, much more obvious. To round out the Christian year, we have the Ascension Thursday, 40 days after Easter. The image on the slide is the Chapel of the Ascension on the Mount of Olives, which is actually currently located in the courtyard, or I should say, it's located in the courtyard of what today is a, uh, a, a Muslim uh, mosque. And Pentecost, or Whit Sunday, the Feast of the Holy Spirit, uh, right after that. And uh, you can click on the link or go to just about any Christian calendar link and see lots and lots of liturgical calendar programs. Here is an image of uh, in this in this uh, in hoax signo in this sign you will conquer. Uh, it is an image of the um, uh, probably the Greek letters I. E S the H would be an E in Greek, or the H symbol, the E looks like that, for the beginning of the word Jesus, Jesus. This slide looks like it has a problem. Underneath it, there are a few other early symbols of the church, the fish, a monogram for ichthos, Jesus Christ, God, Son of God, and Savior, and the I-N-R-I, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, in, in Latin, Jesu Nazarenos Rex Judeorum, and theoretically that in Greek and Hebrew and Latin was posted on the uh, post uh, that was used to crucify Jesus so that people would know what his sin was. Diocletian became emperor in the late 3rd, early 4th century. He died in 305. He established the idea of an Eastern capital and had a major persecution of Christians in 303. Interestingly, Diocletian, uh, his persecution killed St. George, and St. George's dragon, as it were, was the dragon of trying to escape from uh, the crown of martyr martyrdom. Uh, in the retelling of the story, <coughs> St. George is depicted on the horse killing the dragon, even though uh, Diocletian actually was the one who killed him. Within a few decades, though, the course of Christianity had changed. Constantine uh, died in 337. He moved the capital to Byzantium. He won control of the West, and that's where the IHS symbol uh, came in. That was the vision of the cross and the mark on his shields. Uh, he never really became a Christian formally until his deathbed, although his mother was a Christian and went throughout the entire empire finding locations that were associated with the Christian sto uh, story. So she identified many of the churches, many of the holy locations which became churches in Bethlehem, in Mount Sinai, the traditional Mount Sinai, and many other places in Jerusalem, and so on. He gave Christians liberty to practice. He made Sunday a public holiday, which in any case coincided with sun worship, although in antiquity the Romans did not have an idea of a week. They had the month, but they did not have a recurrent period of seven days with a public holiday. Uh, he also convened the Council of Nicaea in 325, which reformed the calendar. It set 
the date of Easter. It adopted the Nicene Creed, adopted a number of other important ideas for Christianity. Constantine was the first emperor to be a Christian. However, after him, almost all the emperors were, except for one Julian. Uh, he died in 363, had an idea of giving the Jews back the area of the temple to build the temple, but he died before that idea could come to pass. Theodosius made Christianity the official religion of the church.